is no less meaningful in the living of it than a life of affluence. Again, it comes down to the how of your living it. Right? And if you, if you realize that your poverty is an, indicator of, an indication of your relationship to your society, it no longer becomes something that's just you. It no longer becomes some artifact of the way the world had to be. And it loses its force as a means of oppressing you, as a marker of your oppression. Uh, and that's liberating, isn't it? So basically, that's like, now I'm in a position to give a big fuck you <laughs> to society. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, beep. You. <laughs> well, what I was going to say was, it basically what you're saying is like, it, <clears throat> it represents like a truer understanding of your position. I mean, maybe, like that, the decision of whether or not to kill yourself represents a um, real understanding of yeah, those are hard words to yeah. use here. Truer understanding, a real understanding. It's a different understanding. And it's an understanding that is only possible from the first person. Right. The rest of the world sees you as some miserable, poor bastard. Mm -hmm. right. And perhaps is right to see you that way. But you, but you, but there's a potential for you to understand yourself that is premised upon the personal point of view, the first person point of view, the point of view of the I. But, but for that to actually be an understanding, it has to reveal something. You have, it has to reveal something to you about yourself that you couldn't otherwise obtain. To see yourself from the point of view of others is to see yourself from the point of view of others. Is that a false understanding or a false point of view? No, it's a different point of view. And it tells you things about yourself that may be unavailable from the first person point of view. But to just see yourself or understand yourself from the point of view of others is to neglect a whole other point of view that is yours uniquely on yourself. And it's from that point of view that you're then in a position to find out what, what means something to you, what has worth to you, what there is to value, and what there is in its potentiality. Does that make sense? So I wanna, I, I wanna be careful about using terms like truer or real because it implies that, that we were deluded or... Not correct in the first yeah. place, right? Okay. Hopefulness is a, it's, I mean, it's, it's to, be, to be hopeful is to be delusional because it's to mistake the point of view of others for your first person point of view. That's what's problematic. But others might have a perspective on you that's really important that you need to know. Right? Your, your, your friend's point of view, a close friend, might have a point of view and understand you in a certain way that you can't see from your point of view. They see you constantly going from bad relationship to bad relationship to bad relationship. Right? They're always the one you call at three in the morning, every two months or so, when this relationship goes bad. And they're like, do you see, I see a pattern in your life here. I see a pattern to your choices. And your response might be, what? I just fall in love. No. There's the how of your falling in love that's in question, right? That might reveal something to you that you, that's unavailable. Let's try this one. <coughs> um, 
So this, this uh, for Camus, this idea of the absurd is really, I mean, that's a, that's a central um, element in his philosophy. A world that can be explained even with bad reasons is a familiar, a familiar world. But on the other hand, in a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels an alien, a stranger, his exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home in the hope of a promised land. This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. This, this, this feeling of strangeness in your own skin, this feeling like, wow, that's not at all how I thought of myself. Or, Or, you know, to suddenly feel, and it could be sudden, but it could take a long time in the building, but that coming to understanding of oneself in the world as though this world is now completely foreign and strange. <coughs> That's the feeling of absurdity. <coughs> and when you truly understand, when you understand, fully understand, and have come to terms with, the indifference of the universe towards you. That's the feeling. And so if the universe is indifferent towards you, then everything is really up to you to give it meaning. Because remember, maybe you don't remember, but uh, a few years earlier, prior to this, Nietzsche killed off God. So <laughs> God's gone. Or he told us that we had killed off God. He just reminded us of that fact. And so that's all gone, right? <coughs> when the world isn't this world of creation and mystery and meaning, <coughs> when there isn't meaning outside of us, it's not a cruel world that undermines us at every turn. It's not a loving, kind world that, that has a plan for us. <coughs> To come to terms with that is to come to terms with meaning being something that is inside. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> meaning and value then <coughs> have to come from within. It's not out there. <coughs> Let's try Sark. How's that sound? <coughs> oh, 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 wait. Before we finish it. Oh, here we go. So, uh, just to wrap up uh, Camus, the short version. One of the only coherent philosophical positions, because remember we started off with the philosophical question of suicide. One of the only coherent philosophical positions is revolt. It is a constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. It is an insistence upon an impossible transparency. Transparency is a theme that runs throughout the modern existentialists. The, the, the willingness to reveal oneself to oneself and to others that transparency. <clears throat> so revolt is a constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. It is an insistence upon an impossible transparency. It challenges the world anew every second. Going back to your point earlier about at any moment I can, I can exercise my freedom and end my existence. Just as danger provided man the unique opportunity of seizing awareness, so metaphysical revolt thank you, thank you. extends awareness to the whole of experience. It is that constant presence of man in his own eyes. It is not aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate without the resignation that ought to accompany it. Without the resignation. 
This life is now mine to live, if I choose to live. Okay. So that's Camus' answer. And then he was killed in a car crash. <coughs> <coughs> Were they drunk? We were debating that yesterday. What were the details? Oh, no, about? they weren't drunk. Um, no, he was going down uh, to southern France somewhere, and he had bought a train ticket, and his, I think it's his publisher, or his editor, said, oh, hey, I'm going down there. They were going to Marseille, I think. Oh, I'm going down there, too. Let's, why don't you ride with me <clears throat> in, the, in my car? And so they were driving, and uh, if you've ever driven through southern France as you're coming down off of the off of the sort of high plains, and you're coming down to the coast of France, there are these windy, windy, nasty little roads. And even now, driving on them in anything but a really finely tuned, tiny little sports car is dangerous, especially if there's oncoming traffic, because the roads are about this wide. Um, and they, uh, they crashed. I don't think there was any, I've never heard that they were drunk. Okay, cool. Um, but he was, Camus was, when they came to the crash, he, he was found with the train ticket in his coat pocket, which is quite interesting. Had he made a different choice, he may still be alive. But he chose to drive with his friend. Contingency of life. In any moment, we make choices, the repercussions of which we have no idea, and yet we have to make them. Opportunity presents itself. The world is unveiling itself to us at every moment. Here comes his, here comes his, his editor. Hey, I'm going there too. Let's drive with me. <clears throat> and now he, suddenly he's presented with an opportunity, with an, with a choice, which wasn't present before. And he chose one way, led to his death. He could have chosen another way. Of course, he could have chosen to take the train, and then it might have been derailed and smashed. And fiery ball of flame too, in which case you might want to go, he was meant to die. But no, that would be to assume that the world cares, the universe cares. That is what happened. <coughs> is it possible that it was an uh, intentional expression of his freedom to uh, die in a car crash? Um, I don't think it was intentional. It's ironic, for sure. <laughs> Ah, cruel world. Let me read you from Sartre. <coughs> so this is from uh, Existentialism is a Humanism. This is one of, his, of Sartre's philosophical works. He also wrote a lot of plays and uh, novels and such. And the, the interesting thing, if you have the chance to read um, some of the existentialist plays or novels, their works of fiction, those are really wonderfully extended and detailed thought experiments. I mean, they're really trying. You can really see in Camus and Sartre and de Beauvoir, they're trying out their ideas on the characters. And, uh, and it's interesting to read them because you might find yourself with an affinity for one of the characters who might not be the character that the author has identified as the hero, the one who exemplifies all of the virtues of existential being. But they're wonderful. The novels are just wonderful. The plays are wonderful, too, to have a sense of how they, how they envision the philosophy working out in the living of a life. <clears throat> A lot of the, the protagonists of Sartre's plays and stories are just assholes. <laughs> You'll see why in a minute. <laughs> he retains from, from Hegel the idea that the fundamental nature of the relationship between self and other is a relationship of conflict and domination. De Beauvoir throws that out. She invokes that. The fundamental relationship is a relationship of mutuality. And reciprocity. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so from existentialism as a humanism. 
If, however, it is true that existence is prior to essence, existence is prior to essence, that's one of uh, Sartre's key ideas. Right? Existence precedes essence. We are, in terms of an existing thing, before we become any particular existing thing. There's no, remember Nietzsche killed God, um, <laughs> There's no, and Camus reminded us the universe is indifferent. There's no essential something. So he starts this off by <clears throat> arguing against Kant and Hegel, who posit uh, a fundamental human nature. And most of the philosophers that we see, even with, not Socrates, but beginning with Plato, we start to see with Plato the positing of an essential nature. Aristotle really <coughs> articulates that. Right. For Aristotle, the, the essence is the whole of the thing, right? The essence is what tells us what the thing is <clears throat> before it even becomes the thing. Right? The essence is what makes it what it is. <clears throat> Enlightenment philosophy is all about identifying the fundamental nature of the thing. And of course, if, it, if, we're, if we're correct, then that nature would be universal across all humanity. There would be a fundamental essence of humanity.